So when I break down all of these different technologies and all these different aspects and elements that are impacting and influencing change, I really look at four core filters. Empower. Empower is all about giving users control. Every iteration over the past few years is leading towards this idea of empowerment of the individual and control. Next is exponential. Exponential is all about the rise of intelligent systems. This is all about the rise of data, algorithms, and all the other key elements tied to virtual assistants, and I'll talk about different levels of autonomy with exponential. Enhanced. Enhanced is really that connection between physical and digital reality. And it's focusing on when our environment is going to adapt to us versus us adapting to it. The final section is a new section. It's called experience. Experience is how we evolve our mindset to fully understand all of the shifts and changes that are happening around us. And how can we capitalize on these specific changes within our individual businesses? Next, we're going to talk about exponential. Exponential is all about intelligent systems and how we can take and expand upon all the, the massive amount, the quintillions of bytes of data that exist and actually be able to understand the signals and drive that back into helping to create and craft new experiences. Now, when it comes to intelligent systems, I've done research across every single generational cohort. And what I've found overwhelmingly is that ease and convenience is the number one reason why people will take and adopt intelligent systems to further drive or you know enhance their lives. So with that in mind, we're going to talk about Pixar movies. We're going to talk about AI. We're going to talk about virtual assistants. And we're going to talk about the proxy web. All right. Who likes Pixar movies? Pretty much everyone, right? Who's heard of the Pixar theory? The Pixar theory states that every single Pixar movie, from The Good Dinosaur all the way through to, to Monsters, Inc., happen on a single timeline. So... And it shows the rise and fall of humanity. Heard my Texas accent a little bit there. Now, we see the introduction of AI in The Incredibles with the Omnidroid. You see it begins to become, it, it learns as it battles the different superheroes over time. But the interesting thing is, Incredibles 2 actually revealed the true master plan. The master plan, it's not about a hostile takeover. It's not about, you know, any of that. What it is... It's about ease and convenience. And I've covered the eyes of the innocent here <laughs> as we look at Wally looking on here to a few individuals. So let's talk a little bit about this whole idea around AI, what it is, why we think about it in certain ways, and what it actually is. So when you think about it, AI is any type of system or robot that has the ability to derive human discernment. So that's an important kind of nuance here in terms of this versus other technologies. Think about like, uh, like the Internet of Things. Now, there are three types of AI. There's artificial narrow intelligence. Think about your Alexa or your Google Assistant. Artificial general intelligence. Again, going back to my gamers, think about Cortana from Halo. And there's basically super intelligence. This is where a lot of our science fiction comes into play from Skynet from the Terminators or Ultron from the Avengers or HAL 9000 for, you know, 2001 Space Odyssey. But the reality is, take all of that and put it aside. We're actually in a golden age of AI right now. And there are three primary reasons. One, the cost of hardware is significantly decreasing over time. And this is a graphical processing unit that you can see on screen. It's both for processing, both visual as well as traditional processing. And also, we have to think about just the insane amount of data that's actually created. We create 2.5 quintillion. That's 18 zeros worth of data every day. The ability to take all of that unstructured information and begin to make sense of that and apply that into action against our core businesses or business needs or identification of these various use cases, it's getting to the point now where you have to have intelligent systems and algorithms in order to do that. Speaking of algorithms, that's the third reason why we're in this golden age of AI. Now, you, you know, you can think, you may have heard the term algorithm in the past. A very simple analog to this is thinking about baking a cake. You're following a finite set of instructions that leads to a tangible end result. 
An algorithm is the same thing. So let's talk a little bit about machine learning. So it's a form of artificial intelligence. It's probably the one that most of you have heard about recently over the last few years, especially in business. Machine learning is simply human coded algorithms. It's to where somebody, some human is training a model that is then taking and beginning to learn over time. Now, one of my favorite examples of machine learning is tied to image processing, and I love this example. So this is an example of a system trying to learn and discern between what's actually a chihuahua and what's a blueberry muffin. And it's taking and learning based on the density of the pixels on the, on the screen tied to the image to then be able to then predict out, okay, this is a chihuahua, this is a blueberry muffin. As models are continuing to become more sophisticated, we also then shift into natural language processing or NLP. Anyone who owns an Alexa smart device or any type of Google Assistant or even Siri, natural language processing takes a form of linguistics and applies them to machine learning. It's actually taking your voice, converting that into text, and then taking and applying that through this, through this corpus of knowledge and information to retrieve back a response to you all in real time, which is amazing. And it's a precursor to where things are going. Now, another facet is called deep learning. So do you, you may have heard of systems that can train themselves to either play a video game or win at Go or you know rapidly go through and understand how to speed run Super Mario. Well, when it comes to, let's bring it back to you for just a second. When it comes to your meta feed, and you think about this for a second, the content that's actually served to you is actually being driven by a deep learning algorithm. So deep learning, it's basically based on the human brain. So it's these convolutional neural networks that are taking and learning over time. You're seeing deep learning being applied in a majority of the big tech solutions that we depend on every day. From your meta feed all the way through to Google search results, deep learning plays a critical role in basically now our everyday world. And for a long time, the practical application of AI in business was really around extraction, summarization, doing different types of weightings, and all these other different things. But moving forward, there have been so many new models developed that are generative. So what you're seeing on the screen is you're actually seeing these images that were generated based off of pure keywords. So you take the keyword avocado and chair, put them into the system, and out comes the rendering of these various images, all driven by AI. And it's not just images, it's also text. So being able to take now and create very complex, you know, even taking and doing high level medical summarization of, of key medical journals and taking and driving that through. Some of our research has found that with these kind of generative systems and these summation systems, you can actually give a higher score than if it was written by an actual medical writer at a fraction of the time. So if you begin to think about the practical application within marketing alone for copy generation, etc., it becomes something that's very important to consider and follow closely, these generative models. Now, when it comes to applying AI to business, I'm a big believer in intelligence augmentation, that these systems, these algorithms, these intelligent systems are all based to help us better understand our world around us, make us smarter, enable us to get focus on the things that we can actually take and, and apply strategic thought to versus going through the process of manually sorting through all of this information to try to find that core insight. It's also incredibly key because the next evolution of experiences are going to be highly predicated on the ability to predict predictive decisioning. Very, very, very key moving forward. We'll touch more about that in the enhanced section, but predictive decisioning, predictive analytics, predictive algorithms are incredibly key to help deliver this idea of ease and convenience across experiences. Also, we're moving from this time of the internet of things to autonomous things, to where our world is going to be enabled by all of these various autonomous vehicles, drones, etc., that are gonna take and again, enhance our lives. It's all about making our lives easier. Now, when I think about autonomy, I, I break it down into five separate levels of autonomy. So level one is chatbot, level two is natural language processing assistance, level three are digital humans, level four are motive robotics, level five, Westworld. Why not? Season four coming soon. 
let's start with chat. We already touched on private messaging earlier in the empower section. What I didn't talk about though, were the conversational AI engines that can actually take and power these experiences on the back end. Some of these engines can flex across not only conversational experiences with Messenger, but also are able to be reused for natural language processing solutions like Alexa as well as Google Assistant. And they're very practical in terms of what they can do to drive a certain action from the user that's actively engaging with that, with that, with, with that threat, that conversational threat. Here on the screen, you can see Kian. Kian is Kia's form of a conversational AI. It's able to drive many facets of basically CRM strategy, drive to an actual test drive location, give you whatever information you need to help you facilitate that pre-buy process. Now, going into virtual or to, vo to voice-based assistance for just a moment. Again, these are all based on NLP type systems. You have 90 million people using voice-based assistance every month. There are 8 billion, billion with a B, basically smart devices that are available out in the wild right now. And the key thing to actually consider, many people think that it might be Alexa or Google, Siri is actually the number one used virtual voice-based assistant. So the average user uses 10, basically, queries. My wife uses it to find her watch. So she'll ask Siri, hey, find my watch, and there you go. Now, in the car, so the car in and of itself is going to be evolving very quickly as we get to this idea of autonomous vehicles. It'll shift more from, from a utility to an entertainment space. But even in how you've got 77 million people using voice-based assistance in the car. This is an example of Google with drive time to where it's able to take and focus, just like you see sometimes in your inbox now, where it can focus these specific things for you. But Google's actually taking it a step further. What you're actually seeing on the screen is the Google Assistant acting as a proxy on behalf of an individual. It's actually going through the process of renting a car. Like it's literally understands all of your preferences, whether or not you need a car seat, and it's going through the entire process without the individual even having to lift a finger. Again, ease and convenience. Now. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm an AI avatar created entirely by artificial intelligence. Now back to your presentation, Tom. Oh, tell me more about the Pixar theory. I love Wall E. So digital humans are an incredibly important part of how systems are going to evolve. Even from a pharma perspective, let's, let's look at this for just a minute. Right now, there's a heavy dependency on pharmaceutical sales reps. And as the pandemic hit, we, got, we saw more and more and more type of shifting towards this hybrid approach to both virtual and digital. Now, there may be a concerted effort to actually shift towards digital humans. The interesting thing here, what you're seeing on screen is an example of soul machines. And with soul machines, they actually can take and it's a form of emotive AI to where it can basically review the facial expressions that I have convert that into how it's going to respond. And it's got a basis of a corpus of information that it's able to take and help me through kind of whatever customer service. You're seeing this actually deployed in financial services areas and others, but these digital avatars are gonna play a bigger role as we move towards this idea of augmenting with a digital workforce. And it's not just digital, we're talking physical as well. So recently Elon Musk talked about how the Optimus, and I immediately think of G1 Transformers with Optimus Prime, etc. But the Optimus robot is eventually going to drive more revenue for Tesla than the actual electronic vehicles. Like that's his prediction. What you're seeing on the screen is this humanoid android that essentially will sell for about $10,000. It's 5'8", 125 pounds. It can lift, you know, upwards of 50 to 75 pounds. And it's basically designed to be an extension of you. Go to the grocery store for you, walk the dog, do all of these other specific tasks so that you again can focus on ease and convenience. And again, the idea of emotive robotics taking that, that humanoid form and then creating more and more lifelike, human-like, basically robotic entities that are physical also is something that's continuing to be driven forward. And finally, you have Westworld. <laughs> Not quite there yet. 
Now, the interesting thing with all of this, as you begin to think, think back to that example of the assistant booking a car on behalf of the individual. I'm a big believer in what's called the proxy web, where my virtual assistant could communicate with your virtual assistant on the back end. If we wanted to have a cup of coffee, they could essentially work together, map the ideal route, know our orders ahead of time, so we can actually focus on the human interaction piece of this and not have to worry about any of the other elements that come with the process and logistics of facilitating a meeting or even ordering the coffee. So that's key. So just remember that, that concept. And finally, as a marketer, one of the things that we have to understand is that it's not just about the human in the center anymore. As these virtual assistants and proxies begin to rise, we're also going to be connecting not only with an individual, but with the, how do you then market to an AI? It's completely different. It's based on different structures, different data inputs. It's less about evoking emotion and more about making sure that the, the, the structure of the data is correct.